Okay. So I left my notes over there, but it's okay. I think we can manage. Um, so I want to talk about um, what it takes to run a FOSS company and uh, some of the lessons we learned. Uh, we, all, we obviously had a few talks about building FOSS-based organizations uh, today. And uh, I want to give you a slightly different take, and I think um, you may find this interesting. So let's start with this very famous statement that's kind of like the theme of this conference. So Linus Torvalds, back in the year 2000, in response to a message on the Linux kernel mailing list, made the statement, talk is cheap, show me the code. And since then, it's kind of become a rallying cry. And uh, I think it's sort of gone to the extreme where if you see the code, then the talk doesn't matter. And uh, what I'd like to tell you is, well, actually, that statement is wrong. So, but let's start with the code. So, if you want to see Hasgeek's code, it's 100% open source, it's all over there. Go to github.com slash Hasgeek. You can copy everything, you can clone my business and make a rival business of yourself. Uh, and I can do nothing to stop you, okay? So, the code's all there. There is nothing between you and the code that lets you run a rival business. Uh, and what I want to tell you is why you will not succeed. So, now this is a journey in five stages, and um, the first phase began somewhere in the year 2007, uh, at which point I had a role in an organization that was creating one of India's first biometric identity programs that was copied by Aadhaar. So I know what bullshit it was right from the beginning. Um, but one of the things that happened when I was working at that particular company is they used to be a government services company. And at the time that they started doing biometric ID and other things, they also started fancying themselves as being a retail company. That they would now offer services to citizens directly, and uh, government services being one of the things that they offer, along with a bunch of others. So when you make a shift like this, when you go from being a services company to being a retail company, you're now an entirely different type of organization. And so you hire new managers. And so the chief operating officer that we hired came up with this brilliant idea saying, let's fire all the software developers. Yeah. Because after all, you are a retail company. Why do we want programmers? You know, we'll just outsource it. So he gave me the job of outsourcing my own team. And so I would sit through these interviews where he would have representatives from various services companies come to the office and pitch the quality of their team and what fantastic stuff they could build and so on. And then I would show them more code and say, look, uh, this is what we have done. This is what you're going to take over. Okay? Uh, if you had to build this much, how long would it take? And the typical answer I'd get is, well, it'll take us about two years. Okay? <laughs> look at them and say, look, we built this in six months with four programmers. And you want to take my job and do it in two years. Okay? Why will I give you my job? I mean, apart from the insult of saying I'm outsourcing my own team to someone vastly more inefficient than me. So, but my COO would not see it. He would just keep insisting and saying, no, outsourcing is the mantra. Outsourcing is what we're going to do, please. you know." Recruit someone that you think is qualified. So this got so tiring that ultimately I had to sit down and write a memo about why it was frankly wrong. And so um, I did not publish it at that point. I published it many years later. Uh, don't bother to read the screenshot. You can open the URL and see it for yourself. But essentially what I discovered at that point was the cost of software. And where does the cost of software actually come from? And it typically works like this, that if you're building an app that is used by a user, your app is not built from scratch. It's built on a foundation. So typically, like, if you're building ERP next, your foundation is Frappe. If you're building Frappe, your foundation is Python. If you're building Python, your foundation is operating system. So there's layers going all the way down, and the further away you get away from your application, the less important it is. Like, there is no proprietiness to saying, I have my own special operating system, which is what makes me superior. I mean, you'll get laughed at if you make a statement like that today. It's better to say, look, the operating system is commodity, is Linux, anybody can download, anybody can use it. So when you use my software, the speciality is that it runs on other software that you already have, and not software that you don't have. Okay? So now you have to find a point in the stack where you say, Everything below this should be open source, and everything above that is my proprietary thing, which is how I make my money. Where is that boundary? Okay. And do you even recognize that that boundary is what matters? The lower the boundary is, as in lower to the bare metal, the more expensive it is to build and maintain the software. 
because it's all your headache. The higher the boundary is, the cheaper it is going to be. But you have no intellectual property left then. Because if everything is open source, then everybody can you know, copy it and run their own company. So um, I came up with this document at that point saying, one of the things that will inevitably happen is that if you're trying to say build ERP next when you're starting with Python, well, you don't have a framework below, so you have to make one. Or you have to use Django or Flask or whatever else. And typically what is guaranteed to happen in, in any project is the immediate underlying layer for your app is something you will want a lot of control over. And so most people end up forking the framework. So I started with Flask, I ended up forking it, and now I have something called Coaster, because I had to make fun of something to put a Flask on. Uh, and uh, now it's become my proprietary framework. I mean, proprietary in the sense that I'm the only user, even though it's open source. Um, and so this, this typically happens. So part of the challenge of running an open source organization is not only are you selling your app, you're lowering the cost of your development by making other people use your frameworks. And so putting it on GitHub is not going to do anything. You have to somehow convince other people to depend on it, which then gives you some interesting problems. So this was my original manifesto from roughly around 2007, saying this is how we need to think about how to structure a company, and not just say outsource to reduce cost. Um, obviously, I wasn't running the company, so I was just a manager there. And uh, I really had a chance to do this only when I started my own company. And so with HasGeek, the first thing, one of the first things that we built was a job board, which looked like this back in 2011. And uh, at the time we put out this website, it was open source, but we didn't tell anyone. Because I was afraid, what will happen if people steal my code? Okay? So we put the code on GitHub. It was completely developed in the open. We told nobody for six months. They were just using the website. And uh, so one of the things I was nervous about is what's going to happen. You know, are people going to steal my code? Are people going to build competing websites? As it turned out, nothing of the sort happened. Because uh, frankly, nobody cares. If you're looking to recruit someone, you don't build a job board. You just put a job posting. Okay? So, so this sort of gave me some confidence saying that, look, ultimately then, if, if I'm releasing my intellectual property and there is no competition, then either I'm in a stupid business or there is something else that's valuable that's not in the source code. It has to be one of these two things, right? If this website is being used and people are benefiting from it, then it's not a stupid business. So then where is the value? As it turns out, the value is in the usage. Because when you're putting out a job listing, you don't do it if you already have a candidate. You're doing it because you clearly don't have a candidate and you want a candidate. And if you're doing it on your website, then you probably already have the candidate. So if you're doing it on somebody else's website, it's because there are candidates there that you want. So why would you copy it and make a rival job board? You don't have the traffic. You don't have the people. Okay. So then the value in this project is not in the software. It's in the usage of the software. And whoever keeps those user relationships is the one holding something valuable. So given that confidence, I sort of went and released my next project called Funnel which was a submission system for conferences. And so this came out a couple of months after the Hasjob project. And uh, this is a bunch of folks in it. And one of the interesting folks you can see is PyCon India. Uh, so Funnel was put out in 2011. In 2013, PyCon adopted it and said uh, they're also going to run their conferences on PyCon India. And that's when we learned the problem with this model. So this is now saying download, use it by yourself. Nobody's going to stop you. If you want to contribute, sure, send a pull request back. Okay, uh, the PyCon India repository, well, this is the website that they built, but you can see one interesting thing about the repository. Uh, and this is a screenshot I made a couple of hours ago. Okay, last commit in 2014, they made nine commits to their folk, but they're behind by 1,462 comments. Okay, so this is now abandonware. Somebody's made a fork, made some changes to it, then decided it was too hard to get those changes incorporated upstream. And then they got stuck, and then they didn't know what to do, and then they just abandoned the project. Okay? And this kind of happens anytime somebody forks your code. Because it's one thing to download somebody's software, it's another thing to contribute back. And if you're contributing back, then you have to be part of the organization structure of whoever is maintaining the upstream project. And so if your goals are not as aligned with your upstream project's goals, you cannot contribute back. Okay? 
the flip side that happens to this is abandoned dependencies. So this is a dependency that kind of hit us um, last week, where we discovered a security vulnerability that had been in our product for the last decade. Okay? And it turned out that this was a very obscure bug where unsanitized user input was placed back in the browser without being escaped. Okay? So you can, this is how you insert a script tag. So we went looking for this and seeing how the hell did this bug remain in somebody else's library for so long? And we found a report. Okay? Look, it's closed. Reported 2016 December. Nobody does anything. The fellows reported a security vulnerability. October 2017, somebody says, hey, this is security vulnerability. Please do something. Okay? Next update, June 2018, the maintainer of the project says, well, actually, it's not serious, but here, I fixed it. Okay? Then what does he do? He's not released it. He puts it in a milestone, which is only 50% complete in 2020. Okay? It's four years with this security bug where it's fixed and not released because the maintainer thinks it's not important. So now this becomes the other problem that you got with open source, that it's on the one hand, people who fork your code hoping to use it can't fit into your organization, so then they eventually abandon it. On the other hand, projects you depend on also abandon their projects and don't take it seriously, so you have to fork them now. And that's what we have to do here and say, look, this man's clearly not impressed by security problems. I have no choice but to fork his project. Now I have the liability of maintaining it because if I lose interest, I will end up being 1,000 commits behind whatever has happened. And this has happened in a different project to do with translation, where now we have some 90 commits behind because a fork we made many years ago has now finally stopped working. Okay. So after we went through all of this, we had to change our strategy and say, look, asking people to download software is a bad idea. Let's make it SaaS. Okay. And, uh, People who don't want to be bothered with software can just use our hosted installation. Don't muck around with things that you can't maintain. And of course, it's still open source. You can still use it. Now, what happens when you do this? Uh, I'll give you an example from somewhere else. This is a screenshot of an email Razorpay sends you. And it says you're paid money to someone. And this fine print at the bottom, which basically says we are not responsible, please. Okay. So what's happening here? You made a payment through a payment gateway to a merchant. The payment gateway is now the intermediary. They took your money and they passed it to the merchant. The merchant failed to deliver service for whatever reason. Who are you going to complain to? Probably your bank. Who's your bank going to complain to? The payment gateway. Payment gateway now has to go to the merchant, but the merchant is being irresponsible. So now, where is the liability stuck? With the payment gateway. So what happens here is that the payment gateway, despite being SaaS, as just a backend service for your actual service provider, is now stuck in an intermediary role because of how the transaction flow happened. And this kind of thing happens in SaaS elsewhere as well. That if I'm building a website for people to host events and there's a dispute between an event manager and a participant, I'm going to get dragged into it whether I like it or not. Okay? And if I'm going to get dragged into it and the participant doesn't know who I am in this transaction, it's like, who are you? Where did you suddenly come from to settle a dispute? Then I've got a problem that I have a relationship that the other party is not aware of. Okay? So next iteration came down to saying, screw all this. We're just going to become a platform now. And the new rule now is you can't host an event if you don't follow our rules, including rules about nice behavior to participants. Uh, but if you do follow the rules, then yes, you're welcome to use the software. Okay? Um, and once you get to this point, and it's still open source, what are you going to do with my software? Because now it is so far removed from the idea of saying, download the software, use it yourself. Now it's all about saying you can see the software. And maybe you can contribute a patch if you're willing to participate in the organization structure that I have set up. If you're you know, capable of passing all those hurdles that you've seen with all these other projects. So this now comes back to saying the original statement. Saying, talk is cheap, show me the code. And I'm saying, I've seen your code, it's useless, show me the talk. You know, the method in which this code is maintained and the participation structures that you create are actually more important than the code itself. Okay. So that's all I have to say. I knew it. <laughs> Oh, 
it working? Did your zero the transaction get resolved with the I mean in the end? There was no dispute there. It's killing me. <laughs> no, no, there was no dispute. So the okay. the reason I had that particular transaction <laughs> screenshot is they've changed the message. Okay. This is not the message you'll get from Resupay now. It's a little more polite. Okay. You know, in this one, the key, you know, it basically says we are not responsible. The new one says we will take a little responsibility in case there is a problem. Right. Right. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Does your talk also mean that you believe now that there are maybe only two ways of uh, hierarchies, possibly, or maybe there's something more? One is probably like the uh, earlier Python way where you have a benevolent dictator for life, or you have the Java way where there's like design by committee, which is also, I mean, both of which have their pitfalls. Or is there any other third way that can be used? Because we talked about hierarchies here. Yeah. So the main thing I've discovered is. Um, in this process is putting your source code on GitHub does not mean open source. And open source license does not mean open source. Because open source organization is what matters. That what is the pathway by which someone can become a contributor or become a decision maker in a project. And that has nothing to do with the business interest. Like just because I put my code on GitHub does not mean that my business resolves or revolves around outside people coming and contributing code. My business is hosting events. So there becomes now an additional layer of responsibility that if you are releasing software, that release is meaningless unless you build a structure for participation, an organization for participation, which is an entirely other operation from your actual business. Yeah? And this is basically what the CTO's role is supposed to be, that you build this operation that involves the community, which is distinct from your business interests. Yeah? And that is, I think, a role that I've not seen any CTO in India take seriously so far. Because all of us have been really good at putting out source code, but not at building external contributor bases, and I'm one of those failures as well. Yeah, Kiran, thanks, uh, thanks for the talk and the provocative. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I come from this perspective, right? That uh, the obligation is only up to the source code. So it's so my journey for ten years has also been like. Uh, uh, you know, you have con you have users even like much before you have like contributors. You have users, and they feel that you know, you as a creator, you're obliged to answer the questions, and you do that because you want people to use your software, also, right? And then there is a the feedback that you get out of it. But beyond that, uh, mandating a contributor or a maintainer to say that you are bound, your labor is bound to uh, the code itself. I think those are two separate layer you know you have the code itself which is one step of the the journey and then maintaining it is i mean it's it's out there you know if if, if there is a sustainable model and there are enough users and there is uh, enough people who are using it contributing and then the maintainer has a model to also uh, sustain the project then it will sustain so but what creates the opportunity is the code itself. Because if there is no code, there is we can't even come to this stage. Right? So. so I disagree there. The code is not the opportunity creator. The participation structure is. And uh, it's a little hard to grasp. So we'll have to revise this in multiple ways. I mean, Linus, despite being the arrogant character that he's in these public communications, has actually built a super successful organization for participation. And um, that is actually critical to this. You know, so. The Linux Foundation, which represents the interests of uh, companies that contribute to Linux, publishes annual statistics on what percentage of contributors are paid contributors from external companies. So the Linux Foundation doesn't pay anyone, you know, apart from Torvalds. Um, but of the people who contribute a patch to the Linux kernel every year, what percentage came from people who are paid to make that patch? And for many years, the number has been 70%. Yeah? So for the longest time, we've heard this theory of how open source is built by enthusiastic volunteers. But you look at the actual statistics, no, it's not. It's only 30%. 70% is people paid to participate. And then there's this question of saying, why are they being paid to participate? What's the point of this? Okay? And that gets you to the point of saying, what is open source? Okay? And this is where you distinguish from free software. Free software is all about user rights. That it's about a user having the right to the software to do what they want with it. Open source, on the other hand, inverts it and looks at it from the maintainer's expectations. So when 
somebody releases software as open source, you're not doing it for benevolence alone. I mean, it's nice that you can show off and say, look, I'm so good at programming, you can see my code and not find a bug. Yeah, it's nice to be able to show off like that. But the ultimate point of putting code out to open is because you're expecting contribution. Yeah? Which then means that it, there has to be something in it for the contributor and you're not paying them. So it has to be some value to their life or to their organization. And if Linux is managing 70% of contributions that way, then they're doing a remarkably good job of value to all the people who contribute. Yeah? Whereas in my project, I've had three or four people over the last decade who contributed a few lines of code. So I clearly have done a terrible job of it. Uh, I understand that you know, Linux has done a fantastic job and you know, that's the reason why we have like, so much community that is built out of it. But my p perspective is also, you know, as I also talked earlier, was that the code needs to exist irrespective of the creator. And that also drives uh, part of the, I mean, yeah, but again, yeah, we yeah, can no, agree to disagree. <laughs> So there is no entitlement. I believe, I, I believe the creator is not entitled to any financial gains from the code, and neither is the community entitled to any free labor from anybody, whether it is reviewing a pull request so this or... Is, uh, Krishan, yeah. This is the thing, right? So this is about shared responsibility. That you have treated this piece of code as a foundation for society to function on, the way Linux is now. That everything runs on Linux these days. It's become a foundation to society. It's become also a shared responsibility for multiple actors in society to contribute to the upkeep of. Okay? And so an organization that understands shared responsibility for maintenance is a crucial missing element in a lot of our open source projects. That we keep thinking the code is what matters, but no, it's not. It's a shared responsibility that matters, and that is not something you do by saying, come and do it. It's something that takes a lot of effort into building. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kiran.